at the principal, actually it is quite remarkable to imagine that there could have been consensus around that set of 27 principles. Uh, and today we see, not just in this process leading to the conference in June, but whether we go to the climate convention, the Kyoto protocol, any of the treaties, uh, as we just have uh, been you know, following the, the fight in Doha, in every one of the fora there is a uh, that there's, there's a clear attempt to basically uh, shift that fundamental uh, compact at the global level. Uh, so what we see here in terms of the real principles is instead of reaffirming it, which is what the civil society community is saying, uh, and so the developing countries are saying is reaffirm the real principles because that's really the starting point and to build on that because that has been really where we have developed the level of trust and confidence for global cooperation. However, we see not just uh, a dilution, but there is a danger that there will be actually a rewriting uh, of the real principles. And the real principles that are of concern, of course, primarily for many of us in the developing countries, is uh, the equity and historical responsibility principle of common but differentiated responsibility. This has been also mis, uh, mis uh, represented as to say uh, it means uh, it's a way for developing country governments to get out of doing uh, actions. It is not because talk about common but differentiated. Everybody has to do and has to act and to shift to sustainability. But those uh, who are in a position to do more because of their capacity and their resource and their uh, and the history of you know uh, uh, of getting developed because of the unfair use of resources, etc., have to take the lead. So what we find now is uh, that that is heavily contested. But the other principles which are extremely important that are also under threat uh, from our analysis is, for example, the Luther Pace. The Luther Pace principle was a hard-won principle in the Rio Declaration. Today, when we see this whole emphasis to uh, the private sector role, and here private sector, uh, I distinguish between the large corporations uh, as well, uh, from the small medium size uh, and the family size firms and enterprises. Here we see that large corporations have been um, uh, moved and uh, invited uh, through the UN system in the last 20 years to become partners and to become financiers and to become uh, leaders in sustainability. We in the NGO community, most of us have never believed that was the thrust that should be relied on. The financial crisis and the role of the big private sector has shown us that you cannot leave the market to be unregulated, uh, that there is no limit to the short-term profit orientation of corporations and financial institutions. And yet, with all that, we in this process, we have as if we have not learned anything from the financial crisis. Today, we see uh, companies like Philip Morris suing the governments of uh, Uruguay, Australia, because these governments dare to have uh, regulation at the national level that will restrict the uh, advertising of uh, cigarettes, uh, because we have this thing called the Tobacco Convention. But uh, these countries are being sued by uh, Philip Morris because Philip Morris claims that their trademark on intellectual property is being violated when you actually put restrictions on tobacco uh, advertising for health purposes. So when we see the kind of things happening, and this is just a few examples, there are many examples in the seed sector, in the medicine sector, uh, and yet we find that there is this big reliance on the other sector uh, to deliver. So instead of polluter pays, there is a trend to say we will actually pay the polluter because we're talking about how to incentivize, we're talking about market mechanisms that will draw the private sector in, and we don't want to hurt the private sector. So this is something of great concern to, to many of us. The fact that in May and uh, March we had this big uh, uh, right uh, reassertion and the, the letter from the 22 uh, UN rapporteurs uh, around the human rights uh, range of human rights in the United Nations. The fact that we had senior officials uh, from UNCTAD had to come out to say we need to defend the independence of the hearts of the United Nations to be different in their analysis compared to the World Bank and IMF and the WTO. There is a huge battle around uh, the United Nations and uh, what it means for, for the people of the planet. Uh, so this is a, a trend that continues. If we look at the, the, a lot of the text, uh, we continue to see um, uh, most developed countries uh, pushing uh, the market mechanisms, the market-based uh, options. Uh, that the fears that we have around the green economy, uh, that the green economy could be another way of actually promoting more commodification, 
of the loss of our natural resources. Um, and it's not just a commodification. We see debates and discussions in the Climate Convention, in the Biodiversity Convention, where financial instruments that have been used to create the bubble and the financial crisis, like derivatives and uh, act, uh, you know, all those kind of uh, bubbles that have been created there, we see the same instruments being promoted uh, for environmental services, for biodiversity, and for uh, atmosphere. Uh, so these kind of like the carbon market itself in the, in the uh, climate uh, arena uh, is exposed now not just for you know by, by uh, independent uh, NGOs or concerned citizens groups but even in the Financial Times you're talking about fraud, you're talking about how it doesn't work and yet you find that some of these same solutions are being promoted uh, in the real process. So this is something of, of great concern. Uh, the, the rights issue remains very tenuous. Uh, the right to development uh, has been uh, vacated uh, in, in, in the last two days, uh, and, and this is part of the real uh, principles also. So we would like many of us to really see if there's one thing we do not want, I think, the 2012 to do is to basically walk away, reject, and rewrite history. Uh, that would be the worst thing if we go back to real 20 years later uh, and to, to see the loss of all those uh, very important principles of cooperation. Many um, uh, parties uh, talk about how the world has changed. Uh, the world is different. But in some fundamental ways, the world has not changed. We have got huge inequalities. Inequity within countries has also increased. And all the more, those guiding principles are very, very important. So this is something that we urge uh, the government representatives sitting in this room to really, uh, we know that uh, there are positions, but uh, within countries, there are also different positions when you're part of a group. And within each country, develop and developing, there are debates among different ministries and different parts of government uh, as to how to deal with this. But in the chaos, we are very worried that some of the most fundamental issues will be lost. The rights issue, uh, and, and many of the rights issues uh, are in post-1992 uh, achievements, like the water, indigenous people's rights, uh, the right to food, uh, we still see that being undermined. Uh, so we, we don't see any change. In fact, we see a much more hardening. Uh, of positions. Uh, the, 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 the Sustainable Development Goals uh, was really put forward as a way to try and overcome the controversies around the green economy. Uh, the green economy controversies continue because we still don't have a common understanding. Uh, and the SDGs have the danger of just basically lulling us and thinking that we may have a solution. But it's very complicated. What is the relationship with the MDGs? We all have been saying as civil society groups, the MDGs themselves were uh, sort of dilution and selective uh, benchmarking of certain aspects of the whole cluster of sustainable development and human rights commitments of the last 20, 30 years. And that's why we, we go back to the Millennium Declaration, which as a political document of the United Nations encapsulates the higher standards of what we had achieved. Uh, and, and now we're not looking to that as a starting point, we're looking at only the MDG. And even the MDG, you know, needs to be massaged to sort of say it has been successful. Uh, and the, all the little things we gain in part of the MDGs will not be sustainable. They may even be disappearing as we speak if we don't deal with the fundamental structural flaws. So MDG 8, nobody talks about. There were never any real targets. There were no indicators for international cooperation. And that MDG 8 requires us to do very, very necessary things with the trade and financial uh, system. And that really has not happened. Uh, so we are very concerned that uh, the, the, the road towards uh, June is only a few more weeks uh, and there's a lot of little details being put on, on, on into the text, uh, but the more fundamental uh, principles and framework which should be reaffirmed uh, will actually be thrown out maybe without even being realized or being diluted and fragmented so that we will leave Rio with very little cohesion and more worrying that we will lower even more the level of trust and confidence to have real international cooperation. I'm not going to go into details because I think all that we will be working through the next uh, two weeks, but at this point, uh, these are some of the concerns that uh, we, we noticed. Um, so things like uh, <laughs> technology transfer, which was within the understanding of cooperation and, uh, uh, and preferential treatment, all those concepts have been thrown out. Uh, and mutually agreed terms and conditions is about commercial contracts. Uh, obligations are turned to voluntary. I was struck when the EU uh, said this morning 
And it is welcome that uh, we do not want heads of states to go to Rio and just do recognition. We want to go there and commit ourselves because we can do recognition at home. You don't have to go to Rio. That's very true. But if you select what you want to commit, so when it comes to the commitment, let's say, on means of implementation, like finance or technology transfer of appropriate technologies, will we see strong language of commitment? Or will we only see commitment selectively? And then we're back to recognizing based on so be guided by uh, the real principles as appropriate has been introduced. Uh, so this is something that uh, I think we need to think about uh, and, and hope we can do. Thank you. Mm -hmm.